Well, we've been in the middle of a series called Baggage. Baggage. Uh, if you have not been here for the past two weeks, I want to encourage you to go to our YouTube channel, Soul City Church FL, and subscribe to our channel, and then look at the last two weeks' uh, sermon so that you can make sense of what, uh, what we're discussing. So we're talking about baggage, and in week one, we discussed, the title was Let It Go. Now, it's interesting because many times, a lot of us in the body of Christ, we walk around with baggage, and many people can see it except you. You're coming to church, you're praising God, you're saved, but you have baggage. And many of us are in denial about the baggage that we're carrying around. And many of us are living frustrated lives trying to blame everybody else about why our lives are not flourishing, why we're not getting anywhere. And we see people just passing us by and we're frustrated. And you know you have emotional baggage because the Bible says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth mouth speaks and so whenever you come across someone that's always speaking bitterness oh they did this to me oh they didn't offer me this oh they bypassed me whenever you hear someone always complaining reciting and rehearsing the negativity that's going on or the, what they perceive as negativity over and over again they rehearse and they recite more their problems than the word of God. My friends, that is a sign of baggage. Here you are walking and God is trying to open doors for you and you can't walk through those doors. You know why? Because what you're carrying was never designed for you to carry in the first place. You're trying to walk through doors and you can't walk through those doors because the baggage you're holding is not allowing you to move forward. And you're frustrated at all the wrong people blaming everyone else but you. And last week we learned, first, in order for you to let go of baggage, whether it's emotional, whether it's past childhood trauma, which I believe all of us in this room, at, to some extent we all have childhood trauma. This is, he, he, here's the thing. The question is, how are you reacting to your childhood trauma? How do you react to what's done with you is what's important. And here's the thing. We learned last week that in order for you to let go of your baggage, you first have to identify what the baggage is. Some of you don't even know what you're carrying around. So the first thing we learned was that you have to identify what is it that you're carrying. What is your baggage? Because everyone has different baggages. It is why no one in here can judge no one. You've got baggage, I've got, we all have some type of baggage. But in order for us to let it go, you have to identify it first. We learned that God cannot heal what you conceal. You have to recognize that you have a particular type of baggage. And like I said, many times we don't see it, but our brothers and sisters do. And then many times we're asking God, God, speak to me. Give me a word. And God is looking at you like, uh, I, I, I did. It's, in, it's called the Bible. The problem is that you don't open the Bible. And the reason you don't open the Bible is because Reading the Bible and studying the Bible takes work. And if we're honest, we're just lazy. We don't want to go through the Bible. We don't want to study the Bible. Here's the problem in the church in general. So the second that we see a promotion about a prophet being somewhere, 
we want to run to that prophet to give us a word. And I want to bring correction to the body of Christ about this whole illusion and misunderstanding about prophets. Because it is doing more damage to the body of Christ than good. If you see a so-called prophet, you go chasing after prophet to give you a word, and you're not studying your Bible, you're being misled. You're being misled. If you go and the prophet is telling you, I see house, I see car, I see money, I see promotion, I see this. That's not a prophet, that's divination. Uh, I sense something, I sense this. Is there something, is there a person that, that's divination. Oh, you didn't know? You better start Googling and studying what divination is and what a true prophet is in the Bible. When they're telling you they're trying to gas and waiting for you to tell them yes or no, that's divination. It's a spirit of divination that's in the church. Because a true prophet ain't trying to ask you no questions. A true prophet is going to come up to you and say, hey, listen, this is what's in your heart. This is what needs to come out. If you're going to ever reach what God... You have sin in your heart needs to come out. And the prophet don't care how you feel. They walk away. That's why in the Bible, whenever God called somebody to be a prophet, they would back away. They did not want to be a prophet. Because why? Because a prophet in the Bible meant that you're going to die. Anybody want to be a prophet? Mm. A real prophet did not want to be a prophet because it meant a death sentence. Because they had to speak the word of God, and the word of God that they had to speak, nobody wanted to hear it. And he had to speak to kings and people in power. Your baggage will never disappear of you running towards prophets, evangelists, conferences. No. The baggage first has to be identified, and it is identified. God uses regular, average people. You don't need a prophet. You need an average person that loves you, that sees it, and say, Mamita, come here. Come here, Mamita. Mama, you know I love you, and I want nothing but the best for you. Those are the people you need in your life. Papa, come here, come here. Listen, man, I've been noticing this about you. I don't know if you see it, but, but look, I'm telling you this with love and wisdom. Then they'll open up scripture and they'll give you scripture, and then they'll tell you what they're seeing in your life that's causing harm. You need to listen to people like that. We don't have to spiritualize this. We don't have to spiritualize this. So you first identify it, after you identify it, you let it go. You let it go. And do you know why you have to let it go? Week two, we learn because God is doing a new thing. And where God wants to take you, that baggage cannot go with you. And let me just say, baggage can be a person. Baggage can be a person that you're holding on to and God never meant for that person to go with you in the first place. And you're trying to resurrect something that's dead and God said, no, it's dead for a reason. I'm a God of resurrection, but I'm not trying to resurrect that. You got to discern what is it that God is trying to resurrect and what God wants dead. And if he killed it, he killed it for a reason. So quit crying about it, quit mourning, get up and say, this is not the will of God. He wants it dead. I don't want to live for me. I want to live for Jesus. That is not his will for my life. I've got to move on, even if it hurts, but I'm doing his will. I'm letting it go because there's a new thing. He's doing a new thing. Could you not see it? Could you not perceive it? Could you not hear it? The new thing that God is doing or desires to do in your life. And so God is saying, let it go. But this is what some of us do. 
He said, let it go. Give it to me. Cast it to me. All right. We open up the baggage, and then we pick and choose what we want to give to him. Anybody been there? Don't leave me alone, y'all. I'm not the only one. We go in, and we're like, yeah, let me, here you go, Jesus. Here you go. Take that. Okay. And we're still in the same boat. We're still in the same situation. We just gave him one. No, he said, cast all. Not what you pick and choose. All. Because if we don't, we're never going to be able to reach where God desires for us to reach here now on earth. He has The future plan to be with him forever and eternity. But right now on earth, he has a purpose specifically that only you can do. A general calling for the church. Go and make disciples of Jesus Christ. That's a a command, not a suggestion. If you're not making disciples of people and you call yourself a follower of Jesus, you have a problem. Because every Christian is supposed to be making disciples of all people. But then there's a specific calling over your life that only you can do. There are certain things that you can do that God did not call me to do. There are certain things that I can do that God did not call you to do. And that's the beauty of the church. That all of us use our God-given gifts, talents, and callings to partner with Jesus to build his church. So now let's be honest for a moment. There are some of us here today who've been hearing for so long that there are greener pastures ahead. That things are just about to turn a corner and we're just tired to hear the same thing. It's going to be good. Oh, the, the, the pasture's greener. It's going to be good. Oh, your blessing is up. Listen, we're tired of hearing that. We want to believe. We know God is good. We're just not sure where to begin if we're honest. If that sounds like you, guess what? I'm so glad you're here this morning. Now, if you have your Bible apps, you have a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, we have you covered on the screen. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 to 7. The Bible says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand. And That he may lift you up in due time. How many know that God has a timing for everything? How many know that? If you don't know that, you need to know that. That's important. Because your timing is not God's timing. And many times we get frustrated in a season because we want things to happen now. And God's saying, well, it's not my time. So you need to discern your timing and God's timing because it will make all the difference in the world. That he may lift you up in due time. Look at verse 7. Cast all. Did it say, it says cast some. Does it say cast some? What does it say? Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. He cares for you. Now, It's interesting because there's so many unjust or unforeseen suffering that we see, that we experience as humans. And if we're honest, unjust and unforeseen suffering is one of the great problems that grips our hearts today. We struggle with frustration. How many know that Christians struggle with frustration? We as Christians, we struggle with frustration. We struggle with anger. We struggle with uncertainty when trials unexpectedly land on our doorsteps. Wouldn't it be awesome if these unexpected trials, these unexpected painful situations were at least text you, say, hey, Um, I'm coming over in about two weeks. Would that work for you? 
How many know that's not how life works? I wish I can get a heads up. That way you can prepare yourself mentally, right? Like, okay, in two weeks I have an appointment with pain. In two weeks. Start exercise, start preparing myself mentally. But life doesn't work that way, church. It doesn't. I wish it did, but it doesn't. You see, too often in those most difficult moments of our lives, confusion reigns while contentment dwindles. Questions arise while prayer subsides. If we're honest, how do you react when suffering comes to your life? Many people crumble at the mere thought of another pain or trial. Others rise to the occasion. And for most of us here today, we're probably somewhere in between. Peter's encouragement to his Christian readers in 1 Peter is one of perseverance in faith. You see, Peter is writing to a persecuted church. You see, church, it's, it's, it's not enough for us to simply get up every morning and, and trudge through each day. No, no, neither it is wise or even recommended for us to put a fake smile on our face and ignore our very real troubles and problems. We can't deny that we have problems. We can't deny that we're going through some painful situations in our lives. Instead, the lesson of 1 Peter is to push through the troubles, recognizing their temporary presence in our lives while walking in holiness and hope as people of faith. I'm not going to deny I have problems. I'm not going to deny I'm suffering. I'm in pain. But I'm not going to give in to the pain, the trauma. I'm not going to allow it to dictate my reaction. I'm not going to allow pain and suffering to dictate whether I'm going to serve God or not. I will refuse to allow pain and suffering to dictate whether I'm going to go to church and serve and praise Him. You see, because I understand who God is. And when you learn about the character of God, you understand that you are not going to allow anything from the outside forces dictate your walk and your relationship relationship with God. I'm going to praise him whether I've got some or I don't have some. I'm going to praise him in the good times and the bad times. I'm going to praise him whether I have a job or whether I don't have a job. I'm going to praise him where my kids are going crazy or they're behaving. I'm going to praise him while my marriage is good or it's not good. I'm going to praise him whether I'm blessed or I'm broke, busted, and disgusted. I'm going to praise him. Why? Not because of my circumstances. I'm praising him because he's God. God, he's holy, he is awesome, and he deserves my praise regardless of what I'm going through or not. Are you hearing what I'm saying, church? He is God, he is faithful, he is holy, and therefore I stay fixed on Jesus. That's Peter's encouragement. I have a few scriptures to share with you. I want you to write these down because I want you to go back to them when you're going through some stuff because they're going to carry you through. How many know that God's word will see you through? Now watch this. I want to teach you something. Prayer may not change your situation, but prayer will change you. Prayer may not change the pain of the circumstance, but it will change your perspective of how you see it. We know this through Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three teenage boys. God didn't take them out the fire. God was with them in the fire. They never prayed, God, take us out this fire. They never prayed. They were just in there, chilling. They're like, yo, this is awesome. <laughs> now, I'll be honest. I am not at that level. I don't know what I would have done, but I definitely won't be happy like those three nuts. Happy as can be. But they have that kind of faith. How many want that kind of faith? You got to know God in such a way like these three young boys to be able to have that attitude. They didn't pray the way. They didn't ask God to take. They said, okay, we're still not going to bow down. 
Because the God we serve can deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we still ain't going to bow down. So you might as well just throw us in the fire. So prayer may not change the circumstance, but it definitely changes you. Look at these three verses I want you to write down. Psalm 55, verse 2. Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall. Matthew 6, 25. Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body. What you will wear is not life more than food, and the body more important than the clothes. And then Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Church, he cares for you. He wants the best for you. He wants the best of, for your wholeness and abundant life. Listen, what father doesn't want the best for their children? Every father wants the best for their children. Now, let's keep these truths in mind as we talk more about Casting all our cares on the creator of the universe. Now, as we identify the baggage in our lives and we let it go and trust God with our future, there is something else, an imperative ingredient to the mix we cannot miss. And I need you to write this first point down. This is the secret sauce. You ready? Humility. Humility. That's the secret sauce, y'all. You cannot forget this. It's humility. You need to be willing to ask for help. To seek out your blind spots. To get untangled from sin. To move forward. You have to. You can't be a know-it-all. You have to go to people who are, who are stronger than you in the faith. Who are more mature than you in the faith. And say, hey, listen. Can I speak to you in confidence? I'm going through this. What do you see? What do you recommend? Can you share some biblical wisdom with me? If you have this attitude that you know it all and no one can tell you nothing because you've been attending church 30, 40 years and you know it all, you, my friend, have a problem with the sin of pride. And it is why you ain't growing. And it is why people don't want to be around you. Because you're a know-it-all. You ever been in a group setting? There's always that one person that always interrupts the person who's talking. Who wants to outdo their story. If they're sitting next to you, keep looking straight. We don't want no problems up in here. And if you're a spouse, do not give them the elbow. These marriages, I tell you. That's you. They're sharing a story. Someone's sharing a story. Yeah, you know, so, so you know, what I did was I, I went over here and then this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Psst, but that's nothing. You know what I did when I, <laughs> I'm like, bro, shut your mouth. Walk somewhere else. This is my story. They're hijacking my story. Nobody asked you. So if you're that person, you might have a pride sin. The Bible says that pride comes before fall. And I can't tell you how many times some of these pastors and many of them personal friends of mine who, who they rise and God is using them and they're becoming very successful, if that's even a word, in ministry. And, 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 and everything is going great. And what happens is they let it get to their head. And they think they know more than everybody. And then they don't want to return your calls. And now talking about, oh, you got to talk to my secretary. And you know what? That has its place. That has its place. Because, you know, you can't have a pack with, you know, 300 people trying to call you. You know, that's, come on. Yeah, we have to have order. But we're talking about, dude, we're friends. <laughs> like, this is me. I'm not a member of your church, bro. People that, that, that you were so cool with, and now they're so big, you can't touch them. And you see how it's getting to them. And then what happens is, you see the pride. They don't see it. And then what happens with most preachers and God, please protect me from ever being in this position where you have these pastors, these ministers, they start hanging around with yes men. Yes men. Their circle doesn't know how to tell them no. 
Oh, we're going to do this. Yeah, pastor. Yes, pastor. Whatever the Lord puts in your heart. Yeah, pastor. And they go along with everything. I hope, I hope the people around me are not yes men. I pray that my leadership will know how to say, no, pastor, let's think this through. Let's pray about this. Does it make sense? Because pride comes before a fall. What is the motive? What is the hidden agenda here? And it hurts and it breaks my heart to see some of my friends fall from grace. Pastoring great churches, great ministries, and now because nobody dared to tell them, bro, take it easy. You're going too fast. You're not seeking advice. You're ignoring all your mentors. It's important to have people speak to your life. You have to get people who are wiser than you, who've been there, done that, that you give permission to speak to your life. That you give permission to correct you. Correction is important. And if you're a type of person that when someone tries to correct you, they have your best interest at heart, they love you, a person who loves you is going to take you aside and say, Papa, I've been noticing this about you, and you need to change. And you get bothered by that, you have a pride issue. Because that person was sent by God. Here we are trying to look for the prophet, the evangelist, and God uses the average person who don't have a title. The average person who don't have a social media presence, who nobody knows, to come speak to your life, and you want to reject them. And you want to get bothered by them. But that's the person that God sent to bring correction to your life. You struggling with marriage? What do you do? You go to people who've been married for years. You go to Mike and Carmen. Take them out for dinner. They'll, they'll, they'll be more than happy. You take Mark and Carmen. Where do you want to eat? And you sit down with Mike and Carmen, people like that, and say, hey, this is what we're going through in our marriage. What would you advise? These are people with wisdom. They've been there, done that. Save yourself $200 to a marriage conference. You think that a marriage conference is going to fix up the problems that accumulated through the 10, 20 years? You think your problems in marriage is going to be fixed in one marriage conference? Oh, you're only fooling yourself. It took years to get there. It's going to take some time to get fixed. But if you keep people like this in your life and you swallow your pride and you become humble, let me tell you, you're going to be off to a good start. But you need to give people permission to speak into your life. In fact, the passage we read in 1 Peter 5, 7 identifies humility before casting your cares. So before you even cast your cares to Jesus, you have to be humble. That's what Peter says. He says, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. That's the first step. You have to humble yourself. You have to have a teachable spirit. If you're not a teachable person, you're going to have a long road ahead of you. I'm going to tell you that right now. You have to be teachable. You have to allow people to speak to your life to correct you. And as you know, it's extremely difficult to work with people who are puffed up with pride. Anybody work with some people that are prideful? They know it all. You can't tell them nothing. It's difficult. Do you think it would be any different in your own relationship with God? The answer is absolutely no. It's the same thing. God trying to work with you, but you have a pride issue. And God's trying to deal with you. And do you know that's why many times God takes us through trials and painful experiences? You know why the goal is? To mold you into the likeness and image of Jesus Christ. So he'll allow you to go through stuff. The question you should be asking is not, why am I going through this? No. The question you should ask yourself is, God, I know you're in control. You're sovereign. You know all things. You knew this was going to happen. You allowed this to happen. So the only question I have for you is, what is the lesson you want me to learn? It's the only question you should ask God. Or you're going through these painful,
crazy situations in life. God, I know you allowed it, and I trust you because you're sovereign, but what is it you're trying? What is the lesson I need to learn? Because you're molding me into the likeness of Christ, so I don't mind because I trust you. But I'm just trying to learn the lesson here. But you have to be humble. All of this, including the life of discipleship, takes an enormous amount of humility. Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you have to, what? Deny yourself. Deny your desires. Deny your flesh. Deny your dreams for my dreams. That's not easy. In other words, following Jesus is not a walk in the park. I don't care what, if somebody is preaching a gospel different than this, that's not the gospel. There's a gospel of suffering. Following Jesus will cost you. Salvation is free, but being a disciple of Jesus, following him, will cost you something. That's a fact. That is biblical, and throughout his history, all the people who follow Jesus suffered. But they didn't mind because they understood this is not their home. They understood they're here temporary. And while they're here, they're accomplishing the mission by which God called them because they're going home. So they didn't mind a temporary suffering because it was making them more and more like Christ. So don't get caught up in the temporal when God has called us something eternal. Now, this is something Jesus knew. And he modeled us for us in becoming human and sacrificing himself for us. Now, I've heard it said that humility isn't thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. And that is a true statement. Now, I want you to write this down or take a picture of it. Here are six attributes of healthy humility for you to think about. Number one, you acknowledge you don't have it all together. Number two. You know the difference between self-confidence and pride. There's a big difference there. Number three, you seek to add value to others. It's not all about you. You minister to people's potential. You help people get to their destination, their God-given destination. You pour into them. Number four, you take responsibility for your actions and you don't keep blaming everybody else for what you did. You take responsibility for your actions. Number five, you understand the shadow side of success. That's important. You understand the shadow side of success, which is arrogance. Number six, you are filled with gratitude for what you have. You are filled with gratitude for what you have. You don't be looking at the Joneses and say, man, I wish I had that. Uh uh-uh, uh, no, no, no. You're content with what God has given you. And if He blesses you with more, then He blesses you. But you don't go out there looking at what people have and desire that. No, 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 no. That's insulting God. That's saying to God, you know, God, you forgot about me. You know, if they get it, I should have it. No, no, no. no. I said this the, last week. If you don't have it, it's because God doesn't think you need it. That puts everything in perspective right there. If you don't have it, God knows you don't have it. And he don't believe you need it. You might want it, but you don't need it. If you need it, God will give it to you. I hope that helps you put everything in perspective. Now, in this list, where do you see yourself in this list? Where do you feel like you could grow in humility? Because all of us have room to grow, all of us, including myself. We all have room to grow when it comes to humility. Now, once you've got the humility thing all lined up, and you know you need some assistance dealing with baggage, here's the next step. Write this down. Step number two. Give it all to Jesus. Look at your neighbor and tell him, give it all to Jesus. Mm -hmm. The key word here is all, not some. Don't be picking and choosing in that bag. Eh, maybe, I think I'm going to keep this. It's only one thing. No, no, all. Give it all to Jesus. Just pick it up and throw it to him. Just throw it. Seems simple, right? 
simpler, more, it's easier to preach and teach than to, than to actually do. Just pick it up. I want somebody to catch it. Y'all ready? I'm going to throw it. Catch it. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. They were like, no. Just throw it. There you go, Jesus. That's what it looks like when you throw it all to Jesus. And guess what? You feel like, wow, man. Wow. Feel lighter. The reason you're feeling heavy it's because you're holding on to something God never asked you to hold. He's asking you, throw it to me. Give it to me. Cast it all to me. You don't have to carry it. So what exactly does that look like? How does it work? Well, one example that comes to mind is the story of Mary and Martha. Some of you probably heard of the story. It's found in Luke 10. I want you to read that. Luke 10, 38 to 42. Now, as they were traveling along, he entered her village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary, but who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. But Martha was distracted. Somebody say distracted. Mm, where's my ham and organ? I'm going to keep saying, where's my ham and organ? Because by faith, it's going to show up. She was at the feet of Jesus, listening to his word. But Martha was distracted. Some of us are like Martha. We're being distracted while Jesus is in our very presence. You know that Jesus is everywhere, but he doesn't manifest everywhere. There's a difference between Jesus being everywhere and Jesus actually manifesting and you feeling a sense of closeness. to Because many times... Jesus is there and you're ignoring him. And he wants you to draw near to him. This is a perfect example. There's Jesus, two women, sisters, and we have two different outcomes. One is distracted. The other one is sitting by his feet. Listening to his words because his words were captivating. His words were sharp. They were cut through the soul. His words were words of healing, of encouragement. But what happens is when you're distracted by the things of the world, when you're distracted by things that do not fulfill your soul, you're going to be frustrated. And you're going to take it out on people that have nothing to do with why you're distracted. And then everybody pays for your attitude. Everybody's, what's your problem? What's wrong with you? Take a chill pill. Calm down. Because you're distracted by things that have nothing to do with your destination. As was Martha. And she goes to Jesus to complain to him. Anybody else do that? You go to Jesus to complain about something that's none of his business. And she goes to him, and look what she tells him. She goes, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things. But only one thing is necessary. Wow. Only one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Watch this. You have to read in between the lines. L listen to what he's saying. In other words, Martha was doing the right thing. In that culture at that time, when you have guests, the women were going and they would start preparing the meal, the tables. It was customary. It was part of that culture. They would go in and they knew what they had to do. They would take off their sandals. They would wash their feet coming in because it was full of dirt. And they would start preparing the meal and all that stuff. But watch this. Mary knew that was important. But she saw Jesus and she's hearing his words. And she chose what was most important over the important. And she chose to sit at his feet. 
disregard whatever custom is, break the rules. Sometimes you have to break the rules for Jesus. When Jesus is in the house, you give him your undivided attention. Jesus tells Martha she chose the right thing, the good thing, and it's not going to be taken away from her. Watch this. In other words, Martha, Martha, you're being distracted by so many things. In other words, Martha's issue really wasn't about Mary not helping her. It was that her mind was elsewhere when it should have been on Jesus. Sometimes we use excuses to get our anger out on people, and it's really not about that. It's about things that you haven't dealt with. And you're distracted about things that don't matter, things that have nothing to do with eternity. Investing your thoughts, your time on things, earthly things, that have absolutely nothing to do with your soul. You got to think about this. This matters because it's going to weigh you down. See, make time for Jesus. Make time for Jesus. Sit with him and his word. Pray, journal, read, and tell him the things you're anxious about, thinking about it, worried and bothered by. Take time to sit with Jesus. You don't have to sit an hour because sitting with Jesus is not about the quantity of time. It's about the quality. I can be five minutes with Jesus. And it's sometimes some of the best time than when I was an hour with Jesus. It's not about the length of time. It's the quality. When was the last time you just sat away with Jesus? And just give him your undivided attention. And just allow him to speak to you as you open his word and pour out your heart to him. This discipline was even modeled by Jesus himself while he was here among us. The Bible would say in Mark chapter 135 that Jesus would often go away alone to pray to his father. Jesus, the son of God. If Jesus, the son of God, would frequently go away alone to pray to the father, how much more do you and I need that time with the father? We need it. And just like Jesus recognizes in Mary's time spent with him, which shall not be taken away from her, we understand any time spent with Christ is time well spent. So what can you do this week to have more intentional time with Jesus? What areas of concern and baggage are you carrying right now that you would like to give to him? And after you give it to him, this is my third and final step. Write this down. Trust him. Trust him. Trust him. Listen, we ended last week's sermon with a similar point. And we talked about trust in week one as well. Now, it shouldn't come as a surprise then that trust is a significant obstacle in the process. Admittedly, I know trust can take time. And for some, it doesn't come easy. And I'll be the first to admit to you, I have a problem with trust. I've had it for many years, and God is working with me. God is dealing with me in the area of trust. Has you ever, have you ever had someone that you love, that you looked up to, that you respected, let you down? That betrayed your trust? I've had people in my life, in ministry circles, people that I've helped open doors, people that I helped come up, people that I've exposed to other leaders that helped them open doors. Only to find out that these people have betrayed my trust. You know how much that hurts? And to deal with that pain and to deal with that trauma? It becomes what Stephen Covey says. You become suspicious. Suspicious of people. Can I trust this person? I don't know. And then anything they say or do, it triggers, it triggers your trauma. It triggers your past experience. And now you back away. And then you feel like you can't trust people. Watch this. If we're not careful, that same suspicious that we have of people when it comes to trust, we can turn it on God. And sometimes we don't get close to God because we relate people's distrust and betrayal with God. We do. Are you suspicious of God? Are you just waiting for him to drop the hammer on you? Reprimand you? 
take everything good from you? Now, I know this may sound cliche, but it bears to be repeated. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. And you will experience trouble. Yes, you will. And you will experience adversity. Yes, you will. And you will experience pain and frustration. But I will remind you today that God still has a purpose and a plan for your life. The promise we get to enjoy as sons and daughters of the Most High King is found in Romans chapter 8 verse 28. Watch this. We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Church, here's my challenge for you this morning. Trust him today. Cast your cares on him today. Toss your baggage onto Jesus and walk a little lighter today. He can cares for you today and it's often the unexpected unwanted and unwarranted events that help to propel us into the next phase of our purpose and many times these events are very painful in the moment and you think you won't be able to move on with your life but I want to challenge you this morning church if you don't quit and you keep trusting God despite every real disappointment and discouragement you'll be surprised by all that lies on the other side of all this pain I want to remind somebody this morning that God is always faithful even when people are not God is always reliable even when people are not God is always trustworthy even when people are not God is always committed to your flourishing even when people are not. God is always truthful, even when people are not. God is always for you, even when people are not. Church, I need a pause, and I need you to listen to me right here, right now. Do not confuse people with God. God is not us. God is good and does good. He is for you and not against you. He goes before you. He is fighting for you. You, he strengthens you. He guards you. He's delivering you from things you thought were good for you. That relationship, that friendship, that job, and there I say yes, even that ministry. I'm here to let you know that God is not going to let anything go to waste. He will use everything that you're going through for your good. Yes, he will. And one of my favorite psalms is David. He pens down Psalms chapter 40 verses 1 to 3. He writes this. I want you to see this. I, I don't have this, but I need you to listen. He said, I waited patiently for the Lord. He's going through some hell. They're coming to kill him. He's there, and yet he takes a pen and he writes this down. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mare. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth a hymn of praise to our God many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him now I need you to see this I need you to, because the English word for waiting patiently is not the definition that us westerners know waiting patiently waiting patiently for us is like you're just waiting there no no the Hebrew word the original language for waiting patiently is the word kava somebody say kava and kava actually means to eagerly expect God. To eagerly expect God to act. In other words, I'm not just sitting there waiting for nothing to happen. I am eagerly expecting God to act on my behalf. Watch it. It goes further. It says, and to be ready to spring into action when he does. So when David says, I waited patiently for the Lord. Mm -hmm. What he's saying is, I know the character of God. Because I know his character, I'm not going to slob. I'm not going to have a pity party. I'm going to cover. I'm going to wait because he's about to do something. And when he does, I'm going to be ready to spring up into action with him. I'm not going to. This is going to turn for my 
good. That's what it means. Kava. Listen, church, I will submit to you that in all that you're going through, he is teaching you something new, a new song, a new way of thinking, a new perspective, a new way of knowing him. Many who see you going through hell and high water are going to look at you and they're going to see you praising God. And the Bible says that they will put their trust in the Lord because of your testimony, because the way you handled your pressure, the way you handled your pain, you did not get bitter about it, but you came and you said, regardless of what I'm going through, I will say like Job did, though he slay me, yet shall I praise him because he is my king, he is my Lord. I'm not going to allow anything to deter my praise. Church, listen to me. God is faithful. So do not fear. Why? Because our God isn't weak. He's not absent, nor he's sleeping. He knows your name, and he hears your prayers. God takes the worst of yesterday and turns it into the best of tomorrow. God is still in the business of turning mourning into dancing. God can make greatness out of a great mess. Even when you don't see it, even when you don't feel it, God is working. He's working things out. Why? Because the God that we serve is a miracle working God. That's who he is. That's who he is. Trust him. Stand on the promises over your life. Recite what God already said about you. He's molding you into the likeness and image of Jesus Christ. That's all this is. Just think about this for a moment. If God didn't care, if he didn't love you, would he share his only son with you? If Jesus didn't care, would he have humbled himself to the point of death for you? Is Peter, who spent years with Jesus out on the mission field and whom Jesus trusted to lead the disciples in his earthly absence, is this same Peter misleading you when he says, cast all your anxiety onto him because he cares for you? Is he lying to us? Church, let go of your suspicion. God is not people. The church may have hurt you, but God is not the church. The church are people. The church are humans. The church have flaws. But Jesus still loves his church with all her flaws. He died for her church. You are her church. People will hurt you. People will let you down. God is not people. God heals. God restores. God restores. If you just give him the opportunity to experience his healing power, to experience his saving grace, let go of the baggage today and trust Jesus with your life today until the day that he calls you home.